if we think of ourselves as a business, one product that's like $3.99 or $4.99, you cannot spend very much to sell that, you know, but if you have a whole series, you might make $20, $30, $40 from a reader going through all of them. So it, it makes it a lot easier. And I, I think also readers become more super fans after they've spent n a number of books with you and your characters, whereas you might be a little more forgettable if, it, if they just had one book. Now that I started plotting my newest fiction series, I really want to release this interview that I recorded with Lindsay Barroker a couple of months ago. Who best to talk about series writing than a writer who's so prolific and has released so many series? I don't want to spoil her anything, but prepare your mind to be blown by her efficiency. Writing a series is really the best way to have a satisfying career as a writer. Why? You will learn in this interview. And there is much more you will learn as well. For example, how to make sure readers go from one book to the next. How to gain more super fans instead of becoming a forgettable author. How to successfully market a series, because there is one most important factor for that. And how to write multiple thousand words a day. Of course, if you desire to do that. So if you want to learn the most important factors of planning, writing, and marketing a series, and get a boost for your efficiency as a writer, listen on to Lindsay's interview. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to the show on YouTube if you're listening on YouTube or on your favorite podcast app, and give a short review or rating to make sure that other people find this show if you enjoy it yourself. Thanks, and let's jump straight into the interview. I am an author of science fiction and fantasy. I have written, at last count, at least 70 or maybe 80 novels between myself and my pen name. And I have been full-time since 2012, so I've been doing this for a while. I published my first book in 2010. So coming up on my 10-year anniversary here, right around Christmas, and gosh, it's changed a lot, but... I've been very pleased that I've been able to continue to make a living this way and I found a lot of cool readers and they found me and they've enjoyed my books so I really appreciate that and I'm very thankful that I'm able to <laughs> tell stories for a living. Didn't you just gasp and hold your breath when she said 70 or maybe 80 novels? I know I did. Wow, 70 or 80 novels in 10 years, it's like 7 or 8 novels per year. Apart from all that, Lindsay has an astonishing biography. Before she became a full-time indie writer, she did so many things. But there was a moment when the penny finally dropped and she started to follow her dream. I was an only child, so I had, you know, my mom was a big reader, so she got me reading at a really young age. I think I was about three and reading Laura, Laura Ingalls Wilder, A Little House on the Prairie, those books. And I also was on swim team as a kid, so we traveled a lot for swim meets and I'd be in the back of the car just reading books. I liked the idea of writing. I remember I, I wrote some stories back then, but I was always horrible at finishing things. I tended to write, you know, the first third of a novel and then it got less fun at that point, you know, or the characters would get stuck or something and you'd forget about it and then next time you pick up the pen you write something else and that continued and also I should say that when I was younger it wasn't really nobody was encouraging me I mean uh, that's not true I had a teacher who encouraged me but everybody said you know writing is nice but you can't make a living from it not as a novelist not unless you're really lucky so they were like get a you know computer science degree or business degree or something and I ended up going to the army for four years and eventually I did get it I used that to pay for school and, and finish my degree but by the time I got out and finished school, I was actually making, you know, money online. I was, I had found out this thing called, there were affiliate programs and Google AdSense had just become a thing. So I started making websites. I actually wrote about home improvement of all things. I've always kind of like real estate and that stuff. So I got into that and I figured out how to, a little bit of search engine optimization. It was a lot easier back then to get in the big directories and get traffic to your website. So I did that for quite a few years. I managed to make a living. I didn't make as much then as I do now as an author, but I also work a lot harder now. And I think that happens when you're doing the thing you really love to do. 
But yeah, at the same time, I would join a writing workshop, the sci-fi and fantasy online writing workshop. And that's kind of when I first started finishing things. It was a little bit, you know, you posted a chapter, people gave you feedback, and you gave them feedback on their chapters. And I, I think it was actually just seeing other people, like, completing their novels, and some of them would get agents and publishing deals. This is a little bit before the Kindle. And it, it really made me want to, like, actually finish. It took a while. It took about seven years for that first novel. There were some starts and stops. I was also uh, addicted to World of Warcraft during these years, which I, I swear I lost whole years to that. And before that, it was EverQuest. And before that, it was MUDs, the text MUDs that you dialed up <laughs> and got on the BBS to play. So I actually had to give up that stuff around 2008, 2009. And that's when I super got serious about writing and finished my first couple novels. I was about to go the traditional route or try to and, and get an agent when I got my first Kindle, fall of 2010. And originally I thought, you know, I'll just use it for traveling. It seems kind of convenient to be able to take many books with you instead of having to figure out how many you can stuff in your bag. And I kind of became a fan then. And I started looking around and people like Amanda Hawking were making a bunch of money and talking about it. And J.A. Conrath was making money selling his books, you know, going direct to Kindle. Almost immediately, I went from like, maybe I'll try this with some short stories to, you know what, I think I'm just going to go in and do this. I, I wasn't intimidated. I knew I'd have to learn about book marketing a little bit different than just search engine optimization. But because I had learned how to make money before from my writing, I thought I can do this, you know, and I definitely did not have success right away with the first book. <laughs> it was, but it did grow. I had a free, put out a free short story. That was sort of the first thing, you know, it was tied in with my first novel, which was The Emperor's Edge. The, the short story I'd actually written to submit to an anthology didn't get in. <laughs> I was like, I have this story. I'm going to go ahead and use it. So I got a cover. And it, it was kind of a fun story that featured the banter between the two main characters in what would become the My Emperor's Edge series. So I put a little teaser at the end of the short story and I put that out there for free and said like, hey, if you enjoyed this, maybe you should check out the novel that where these characters first meet. And, and that was the first thing that started kind of moving the dial and helping me to sell books. So I don't know if all of your books, but most of your books are series, right? Or all of them? Most of them. I have a couple of standalones here and there, but even then I always am like, maybe I'll go back. You know, <laughs> I always, once I kind of get to know the characters, you know, I want to do more with them. And I feel like most of my readers are the same way too. Like even after I, I feel like I've finished an eight book series, like I just finished a sci-fi series, Star Kingdom totally wraps everything up in the end. I mean, I think it's a pretty good ending and you know, the reviews suggest they liked it too, but everybody's like, well, when's the next one? You know, you're going to do another series with these characters, right? Or, or some more. I'm like, well, we'll see, maybe. <laughs> so yeah, I kind of get to answer the question a little bit already, but why serial writing in the first place? In the beginning, it was just because that's what I always loved as a reader. Once I got to know the characters, I was super disappointed if that was the only book with them. It's why I kind of, I think I gravitated more to like fantasy and sci-fi than maybe romance, where often it's just they have their happily ever after and that's it. And then the author writes something else. Fantasy and sci-fi are kind of been known for trilogies and series all along. And uh, now that I know about the marketing and that, you know, you're going to put a lot of time and effort into selling your book, it's actually better if you put that time into book one and then you manage to hook them and then you've got seven more books that they can read at full price. You don't have to make book one free or 99 cents, just kind of lure them in with the, the free sample, you know? And so it makes a lot of sense. You can afford to spend more marketing that book than you could if that was it. Like you're, if you only had one uh, product, <laughs> if we think of ourselves as a business, one product that's like 399 or 499, you cannot spend very much to sell that, you know, but if you have a whole series, you might make 20, 30, $40 from a reader going through all of them. So it, it makes it a lot easier. And I, I think also readers become more super fans after they've spent n a number of books with you and your characters. Whereas you might be a little more forgettable if, it, if they just had one book, especially if they're a voracious reader and they read a couple hundred books a year, uh, it's a lot easier to forget just one single book than a series of 10. So that's 10 years of experience writing series. A lot to pull from for us listening to this interview. In these 10 years, Lindsay has learned a lot about writing series and the do's and do nots when it comes to that. I know the readers actually kind of hate cliffhangers, but I found them to be very effective. So what I try to do is 
I try to make, in most cases, each book, each novel is a complete story, but it's very much leading into the next one. Like there's a, there's a kind of the mini story in that particular novel. And then there's a greater story arc that might span six, seven, eight books or more. And I find that that's really effective for getting a better read through, having the readers continue on. When you write books that are like really encapsulated, each one is a complete story, which is very common in like cozy mysteries or or thrillers. You know, they get the bad guy at the end and then you're relying on the reader liking the characters enough to want to go on to the next one. And that certainly has worked for a lot of people, especially more, I would say more so in the past in traditional publishing, there is just less competition. And a lot of the authors that are very popular today that have done book series like that, like, uh, you know, Jim Butcher in, in fantasy, for example, they got started 20 years ago or, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Some of the people that are real popular today, Stephen King, I think started in the seventies. So it's a little hard to compare what has traditionally worked with what works now. So I usually suggest to people that even if they're going to do standalone books in a series, have some questions that are not answered, maybe about the main character or something he's trying or she's trying to resolve and the reader really is rooting for them and wants to see them resolve that. So that there's kind of a thread that people want to keep reading and they're compelled by, you know, more than just the characters. I mean, hopefully the characters alone sell it, but if there's something that's left unresolved, we as human beings, we kind of want to solve the mystery. It's just natural. We want to know what happens next. So yeah, having, even if you're doing standalone, kind of having an arc or something going on to draw the readers through the series, it definitely has worked for me and I've seen it work for others too. So having a story arc that encompasses all books in the series, all seven or eight books, maybe even more, is the best way to get readers from one book to the next. But how about planning this huge story arc? What is Lindsay's process of planning this arc and planning the whole series? In my case, I need to kind of know how things end before I get started. I like to know that just so that that way you can really wrap things up well and end in a bang and you don't get yourself stuck in a situation where you're completely flying by the seat of your pants. Because I, I feel like I've seen that a lot as a reader and as a, like a television viewer where they didn't really wrap things up that well and people were kind of disappointed and had a bad feeling at the end of the series. Like, oh man, it seems like they had no idea what they were doing and they were just making it up as they went. Even if you're doing that, you don't want the reader to feel like you're doing that. So I usually give myself some leeway. I might plan for minimum of five books, but leave it in such a way that like, if it looks like things are going well, maybe and I'm having fun still with the characters, I kind of can continue it on to maybe eight books or nine. Usually there's something they're working towards. I know there's going to be like a, a big epic battle at the end and they have to overthrow the king or, or whatever it is. And then I outline the first book before I get started, but I've learned that I tend to deviate from the outline enough that there's no point in trying to outline books two, three, four before I've even started. So I kind of have some ideas of what I want to happen in the series because I want them to be able to make progress towards their end goal. I think that's important too for the reader to have a feeling that with each successive novel in the series that the characters are kind of having that forward progress you know they're like in the game you're leveling up you're getting better armor to defeat the bad guy at the end and you know so if I feel like when you don't have that in a series sometimes that's you'll see the reviews like oh well this book nothing happened and it's like well yeah because the reader didn't really feel like the character the story was moving forward so it's a little bit planned all in advance but it, I definitely leave myself open to like sometimes you just have good ideas when you're writing and you're like oh I totally want to do that and so I don't like things to be too rigid I, I like to leave it open and but by having by kind of knowing that end and knowing that eventually you're gonna have to face this and something's gonna change on an epic scale. You know, not, if you're doing cozy mysteries, you don't <laughs> probably don't need things to change on an epic scale, but you know, something at the end is gonna really tie everything together and make it feel resolved. I, I always wanna know what that is along the way. And then I'm just kind of working my way towards it. And maybe they're having some fun adventures on the side, but they're still getting a little bit closer, like some more clues or whatever they need to uh, solve the, the big problem in the end. When we're talking so many books, we of course want to make sure that the world is congruent, the characters always look the same, the rules of this world never change because we just happen to forget them, and so on. So what's the best way to remember all of this information? Maybe a serious Bible? 
in my first series, I just was like, oh, I'll remember everything, you know, because when you start, especially I didn't necessarily think I'm going to be writing 80 books someday and have all these series. And at this point, I know that I have to take really good notes because I will not remember everything. So yeah, I do like a series Bible with notes to myself about the world building, anything I make up, races, languages, religions, planets, <laughs> you know, with the sci-fi and fantasy, you're on a big scale. I do that. I use Scrivener and so I make character sheets for everybody. And if there's like some secret tidbit that I came up with on the fly, I definitely put it in a character sheet so I can remember it later. And, you know, I, I keep all the outlines that I do, even though I do them one at a time. I, again, I keep them in my Scrivener file and I just copy them over to the, the next novel when I start a new one. So it is important for me. And it's probably important for anybody that's, you know, some people, if you only think you're going to do one series and you've had the characters in your head forever and you really spent a lot of time with them, maybe you can keep it straight. But I would just assume that, you know, you, not only while you're writing, but if you ever want to come back to the world, it, it's good to have those notes. Like if five years later you decide, oh, my readers are asking for another in that series and it did really good. You're probably gonna have to reread everything anyway, but it can also help if you had notes to yourself like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I got to remember that, you know, maybe I should explore that side religion I made up or that weird little cult or whatever in, in a new book. So definitely notes. Yeah, so how do you actually write? If you have an idea for a series, do you write the whole series at, at once, let's say book one, book two, or do you switch between series? You write book one there, then you'd start a new series and so on. And if you do switch, how do you manage to transition between those two worlds? I find it much easier now to write one series from start to finish. I didn't always do that. I was a little slower writing then. I was still working full time at the other stuff. So my only, my goal was like maybe a thousand words a day. And so they were pretty long novels. They ended up being like 120 to 140,000 words. So that would be a novel every five, six months or so, which I thought was pretty good. But <laughs> compared to how I write much faster now and uh, compared to some other authors that wasn't so fast. And I thought, gosh, you know, and you can really see too, like with, as a self-published author, you can see your sales day to day, hour to hour. And you know when things are kind of tailing off after you know a couple months after a new release so I decided to write a series of novellas in between those thinking oh this will be easier and it'll give me something to release in between and it worked okay but I did find that as I continued on it just became as I've written more and more series it's just much easier if I can just focus write one from start to finish and then go on to something else I don't always manage to do that in my last series, I mentioned the sci-fi I was writing. By the end, the the books were quite long. The last couple were over 150,000 words and had six or seven point of view characters. And it was just, they were hard work because you know you have to like have all these different stories going on at once basically and kind of make sure everything still works in chronological order and the characters meet up in the right places. So those were challenging enough that I kind of needed something easy in between those last couple. So. I started my urban fantasy series that I was my main project for 2020. And that was, those were just Death by Dragons is the name. And the heroine is just, it's just a one point of view, first person. I think all of the novels are kind of between 75 and 90,000 words. So not super short, but compared to the other series, they were shorter and easier, much less complicated when you're just doing a first person story. Because there's only, there can only be one story, really. I mean, there can be other stuff kind of going on, but it's basically that one person story. So in that case, I did work on two at once, but it's not my preferred thing. My preferred thing is because I have in the past left a couple series that I didn't finish because maybe they weren't selling as well as I was hoping or the reader feedback was like, oh, this is not like your other stuff. We're, we're not quite as into it. And I let myself kind of get discouraged and try something else. And it's really hard to go back and finish something years later. I, I have gone back to finish one of those and I have another one waiting that I have to go back and, you know, kind of reread everything and, and try to finish it up. So I'm much better these days about finishing a series before you know, completely moving on to something else. And, you know, everybody's different, but that I've found that's easier. Uh, if I go from start to finish, I don't have to like do the rereading that I have to do when there's been a time gap between when the, I wrote the last one. So it, it's more efficient that way for me too, which once you're full time and, and writing a lot, it's to be efficient is a good thing. <laughs> like when it's your hobby and you're kind of learning along the way, you're not too worried about how long things take. But once you're actually like, okay, this is the day job. I only make money when I publish books. You know, you want to be as efficient as you can. Talking about efficiency, the next one will blow your mind. 
Because do you know how many novels Lindsay writes over the course of a year now? I think I've been averaging about 10, probably the last three or four years. I wow. had a year or two where I, I did a bunch with a pen name. So I, there weren't as many under my name in those couple of years. But yeah, it's, a, it's I'm, I keep saying I'm going to slow down. Like I can, I, I do well for myself. I'm not going to be broke next month if I don't publish a novel, but I don't know. I still have all these ideas always. And I'm like eager to finish the series I'm working on so I can start the next one. So, and I, I'm working on finding that, I don't know. Well, this year I was actually going to take some time off this year and travel and then uh, we had COVID. <laughs> so I said, well, I might as well just work and write more novels. And then next year, maybe I can take some time off and, and do some trips. Wow, 10 novels a year, it's, it's crazy because I'm a very slow writer. Tell me, what's the secret? How do you manage to do that? Well, I told you in the beginning, the first novel took seven years. So I think that's very common to start out slower. And because the first time, you know, the first few novels, I would say, at least in my experience, you know, you, you hopefully write your rough draft. I, I do make myself write the rough draft from start to finish without doing any editing until I'm done. If there's something I want to remind myself to go back and do, I just make a note so I can address it when I go through my editing pass. So writing the first draft from start to finish is helpful. Obviously, if you can do it full time, that helps. I mean, that was sort of the first thing that I was easy. I was able to bump it up to like 3000 words a day once I made the switch to full time. And then it was a lot of just being inspired by others. I'd hear like people doing podcasts. Oh, I got my five, 6,000 words done today before the podcast. I was like, geez, that's a lot of words. And it's only like one o'clock, you know? And then uh, Rachel Aaron came out with a book called 2K to 10K, which I think everybody in the writing community has heard of or, or yeah. maybe read. And so I found that she was doing, the things she recommended doing were basically things I did anyway. I, so I just was, a lot of it was just like going, okay, if somebody else can do it, I can do it. And so I don't always write 10,000 words a day, but my goal is usually like 7,000 on a, a writing day. If I'm doing admin, I don't worry, you know, I just take the day off and don't try to write. And I, just, I actually find it easier to just write the first draft kind of as quickly as I can, two to three weeks, depending on how long it is. And, and because then everything's just kind of playing like a movie in my head, I'm not having to go back and reread stuff to remember, oh, what did I already do in that scene? So a little bit of it's just practice and, and being inspired by others, like knowing if other people can do this, I can do this too. I will say though, you get, you get more efficient as you've written more. Like in the beginning, I did a lot of editing passes. You know, I had, I gave it to the workshop people each chapter to edit and then they'd, you know, they'd say their stuff and I'd go back and rework it. And it's, you know, it's just now, like I said, I do the first draft completely. Then I do my editing pass where I'm just cleaning up the sentences and um, putting in anything I forgot or realized I needed to develop a little more or if there's like something foreshadowing I need to add. I do that in that pass. And then I give it to my beta readers. And usually while they're reading it, I'm starting the next project. And then they send it back a couple weeks later with uh, any thoughts, any major things that jumped out to them. And if I agree, I will edit it and change it and work with it. And, but I'm always the final say, right? I'm not, I'm not writing by committee necessarily, but they often point out, you know, a few things that I want to address. And at that point, I send it off to my editor. And again, I'm usually working on the next thing while the editor has it. She sends it back. I send it to Typo Hunters. I didn't, use, I didn't do that in the beginning. In the beginning, you don't usually have a whole team of people. It's, you kind of get those people along the way you know, and they go over it and kind of pick up those last things that the editor missed and that we all missed. And at that point, it's pretty much ready to publish. And hopefully by then I've kind of got the rough draft of the next one done. So it's a bit, a little bit of an assembly line kind of thing. I'm, I'm not good at taking off time unless I actually take a trip or vacation. That's why I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that this year. You know, I I'm, I'm, can take a couple of days off, but I usually end up I don't know, I'm doing chores around the house or something. Apparently I can't take time off very effectively, but I don't know. That's, we'll see. Uh, but you know, even if you're just doing like a thousand words a day, you can get a rough draft in like three months or so, especially if you're writing shorter novels, like 50, 60,000 words. So a lot of it is just becoming, getting better at the editing. I started out as a pantser, which is fine. 
perfectly legitimate. Lots of people do that. But I found for myself, when I started outlining the novels ahead of time, I was a lot less likely to write myself into a corner or have scenes that I ended up cutting and completely like rewriting. Uh, so, so now I've kind of got the outline gives me a, a map to follow to get to the end. And it's really rare for me now to have like a, a scene that I cut or something like that. So just figuring everything out ahead of time that one of the things Rachel Aaron mentioned in her book is just, even if you're a pantser, just kind of sit down or while you're walking the dog or in the shower or whatever works for you, figure out the next couple scenes in your head before you sit down to write. And then it becomes a lot easier. And you kind of, if you're working a couple scenes ahead in your mind, then you're less likely to get stuck and less like you're going to see the problems in the story before you actually write them and go like, Oh, I guess that didn't work. So, yeah, long story is this, it does get a little easier over time. It's just like any, you know, hobby or like a sport that you're learning. You know, it's very hard. Like I always, do, I do a skiing analogy. If you've ever skied, you know, the first time you go, it takes you a half hour to get down the bunny slope, you know, and then by the time, by the end of winter, if you've been going every day or even once a week, right, you're just like, that's the thing you cruise down in 30 seconds at the end of your long run down the mountain. So practice. Practice is key when it comes to riding like with every other endeavor. I just want to point out that this is not a competition. Some people can write 7, 8 or 10,000 words a day. But if you're like me, a creative who's interested in many, many things, doing podcasts, making online courses, blogging, YouTube, writing nonfiction and many, many more things, you just can't write 7 or 8,000 words a day. And this is fine too. Make up your own definition of success and efficiency. And please make sure to take breaks. Now, let's make a cut and jump into marketing. I won't even ask where Lindsay finds the time to do her own marketing because she is an indie publisher. But what are the most efficient practices when it comes to marketing series? My favorite thing that I, that's worked all along and that I've been willing to do all along is make the book one free. I don't always do that right now. Like when I launch a new series, I do do Amazon ads and Facebook ads and the things that I've tried and that have worked, I'll do. I usually, when I launch a new series, I kind of spend a couple of weeks where I'm really sort of focusing on that marketing aspect. The nice thing about series too, is that after you launch that first book, there's not as much marketing to do for like the next seven books that you write, you're basically going to email your newsletter and I entice them to sign up to the newsletter by offering a free bonus story, which may be like a prequel novella that's like from the point of view of the mysterious character that, you know, we never got his point of view in the main series, something that's exclusive to the newsletter and that people are willing to give their email address in order to get. So but for subsequent books in the series, I'm just emailing the list and like I had to do the Facebook page author page that's been a pretty it's been worth my time i have used affiliate links to actually track like how many sales do i get from this so i do post there fairly consistently just little snippets of what i'm working on or goofy pictures of dragon things i found on etsy you know kind of within my brand basically but nothing serious nothing that takes more than a couple minutes to do so I probably spend only 10 minutes a week on that. And, but yeah, so you spend time with selling the first book and then maybe you keep something running. Like these days, Amazon ads are pretty effective for me. So I'll leave those running. You know, I'll kind of figure out in that couple of weeks where I'm spending a lot of time, like which ones actually convert pretty decently. And I'll keep those running, cut off the ones that don't. And that, so that'll keep people trickling into the series as I'm working and releasing new ones. Later on, I may do a, a sale of the first one, like, like the five day, this is free. I've always found that since I don't particularly write to market, like I don't write anything that's super trendy just because I'm not super trendy. And I usually don't think like the things that are popular that much. I find that I have to, I'm, that's why I'm willing to do the free book one. You know, if you write something that's totally on point and everybody loves those kind of books and there's a huge market for them, you may not need to do that. But I found that I have to like hook them, like get them to try something, take away any fear of like having wasted their money or anything like that. So, and I'm happy to do that because I don't want anybody to spend money on my book if they find out they don't enjoy my writing and my stories. So I figure they can get that for free. And then if they like it, they can read the other ones. And I, you know, I'll continue to do some little things, especially for, I have a big backlist at this point, you know, I'll, I'll apply, if I can get a book bub, great, you know, those are hard to come by, but I'll do like a, 
e-reader news today, you know, the sponsorship sites. Sometimes I just do a big post on Facebook on my page. It's like, this is everything that's free right now. And I'll try to kind of have mix it up. Sometimes I have different series that have a free book one. I have a couple that are always free, but, you know, and I find that a lot that may be worth boosting, paying $100 to boost that post. But I also find that now that I have quite a few readers that they will share that even if I don't ask them to, because they want their friends to check out my series. And, you know, if their books are all free, there's no, you know, nothing to worry about for them except their time. So I do a little bit here and there, but main push is around launching a new book in a series. And then I kind of go into my writing cave for a while and focus on just writing more books. When I wrote my first trilogy, I found that it was quite difficult to decide how to market subsequent books in a series because readers had to start with book one in order to understand the next books. I encountered the same problem when it came to writing blurbs for those books because if people just stumbled upon them, they wouldn't understand it because they had to read book one. So how to solve that problem? In my case, almost all of my series are like a part of a larger arc. So they would be confused if they started with like book four and hadn't read the previous one. So I really focus the marketing on book one. And then after like a year or maybe after the series is complete, if things have kind of fallen off on book one, you know, or on the series, that's when I'll release a box set of the first three books, books one, two, and three usually. And then I'll kind of shift the marketing over to that one. And it's sort of like having an all new product. As far as the stores know, there's no history of it. There's no sales history. And I, I might even do that at 99 cents for a while before putting it up, back up to 9.99 or something. And I will often try as far as the blurbs go, a different blurb on the box set than on the book one, like a kind of a different angle, almost going for a different target audience, you know, trying uh, trying this still the same sort. Well, actually, you're trying to blurb three books. So you have to kind of do it differently anyway. With my first one, all I did was like take the blurbs from books one, two, and three and put that on the product page on, you know, Amazon and the other stores. But I realized I was missing an opportunity to kind of rewrite it in a different way. And I actually, my Dragon Blood series, which was kind of my second big series, the first books did okay. You know, they, they actually, you know, they did all right. But it wasn't until that I did that box set and I really did a different blurb. I had to, like I said, because book one had different characters from book two as the main heroes. And I was like, oh, what kind of, how can I do this so it works for the box set? So I made it more about the world and kind of the big picture rather than I usually focus on the characters. And for whatever reason, that blurb has done very well. That box set did very well. Sort of one of those first things I did that actually sort of stuck on Amazon, like they, you know, like all authors hope their books will do. And I, you know, it was 99 cents for three books. So it was an amazing deal, but other things I've done that with other things and not had as much luck. And so that was kind of the series that first really took off and started you know, bringing in the big dollars, I'll say. <laughs> and, you know, that one still does well for me. And I haven't even touched, I haven't touched the cover art, even though it's kind of dated and it's like, oh, that's not like that great a cover art, but I've been afraid because it's just always done so well for me to mess with the blurb or anything on that one. But it's a very different blurb than I did on like the book one in that series. So I always recommend that to people. It's sort of a chance to just test, try something a little different. You know, you might get like another audience that can enjoy your book or, you know, focus on a different trope if you've got a couple different ones that you could focus on for the blurbs. The most important factor when it comes to series is obviously read through, meaning how many people that read book one actually go to book two and then read book two and actually go to book three and so on. How can you boost read throughs? Cliffhangers are obviously one major technique, like Lindsay pointed out earlier leave some kind of cliffhanger, even if you wrap up the story of the book itself. What are other techniques to boost read-through? Good stories. <laughs> yeah, kind of what I mentioned before with the series, if there's still questions that are left unanswered about the characters, I often have like a antagonist that's maybe not truly the antagonist or somebody kind of mysterious that you want to know about more about in the series that can keep people reading on, you know, and then just having also written a, a story that feels complete. That's why I try not to make like a, I've had a couple where there's like, it's part one and part two. And obviously that's not the, you know, the cliffhanger is really a horrible cliffhanger and the story is not complete, but those were actually later in the series. I wasn't trying to hook readers that way, but yeah, cliffhangers are good. I mean, readers hate them and they'll complain about them in the reviews, but I find that if you still gave them a complete feeling story and that the cliffhanger is just, 
part of the ongoing story arc that that can work pretty well and they're not as bitter as long as they do feel like there was forward progress and that they did get their money's worth for the novel i am always willing to and you know i don't try to charge as much as i possibly can i do about 4.99 is my regular for ebooks trad publishing still makes that look like a deal you know since they do 9.99 i always want readers to feel like they got their money's worth so i think that yeah the cliffhangers and this unanswered questions is sort of a way to keep them reading And of course, the last but probably most important question. What's your favorite story and why? I'm a big fan of Lois McMaster Bujold's Four Kosigan series. It's a sci-fi series. And I was actually not a fan of sci-fi books until I read that series. And I'm still, I'm more likely to like the Star Trek and Star Wars, the TV shows and the movies. So, because a lot of the sci-fi I tried to pick up other than like Star Trek novelizations would be kind of the hard sci-fi or it'd be so tech heavy and not a, not characters that I really enjoyed reading about that I didn't get into it until, you know, probably my 20s, I think I found her books. So she was a the first sci-fi author I read that just had these really amazing character-centric stories. They're still very smart, intelligent stories. That there's a science-y aspect to them. But um, yeah, and she has humor too. So she kind of had all the things I wanted to be. I mean, I was writing my own stuff at this time. So I had my own style. And I, But it was like, oh yeah, it is okay to have like serious stories, but humor and kind of some banter from the characters. So I've probably reread that series four or five times at this point. Definitely recommend people if they like sci-fi or even if they don't, check them out. They're good books. Phew. Don't you feel like you could use a boost in writing more words per day? I definitely do. But first, let's review what we learned in this podcast interview. Writing a series is the easiest way to make money as a writer and also quite satisfying because you get to spend time with characters you love and the world you created over the long term. When you write a series, make sure that you have a great story in place and put in little cliffhangers at the end of every book to direct readers to the next one in the series. Cliffhangers might give you some bad reviews, but if you wrap up the major story of that book so that it feels complete and satisfying and your characters have made progress overall, cliffhangers can boost your read-through significantly. Have a big story arc for the entire series because this will keep the reader's interest across the books and figure out the ending of that arc in advance so that you know where you're going. Make sure to write down details so that you can easily look them up when you're writing. Details about characters, the world, story bits that you want to pay off later and so on. Also, make up your own definition of success. If you want to be a prolific writer that writes multiple thousand words a day, It is possible, because if others can do this, you can too. And practice will make you a better and faster writer. A series overall makes you memorable in the minds of readers and brings you super fans because they will stick with you over the entire series and even for your next one. Focus your marketing energy on the first book in the series. Make it free to entice readers or get it down to 99 cents and so on. Also, make box sets from the series because they can boost your sales in an entire different way. And now lastly, where can we find Lindsay and everything that she does online? I am in lots of places now, you know. I've got my website, lindsaybaroker.com. I just started a YouTube channel under my name, doing some Q and A's for the readers. Got a couple audiobooks on YouTube for free. I do, I'm one of the co-hosts of the Six Figure Authors podcast. And we try to get, you know, we talk amongst ourselves. We've all been in the business for 10 years or so. So we have pretty good experience and we try to get good guests on too, to fill in the gaps where we don't necessarily have experience. So check that out if you're a podcast listener, which I assume you are if you're here. And yeah, you can find me on Amazon and all the bookstores. I often have a number of free book ones if you want to check them out. Uh, I think that's about it. If you get anywhere close to spelling my name right, Google will probably guide you to the right places. Yeah, and obviously I will leave the links in the show notes. And I really love your Six Figure Author podcast. I've been following it for a long time and it's it's really great. Can't recommend it enough. Okay. Thank you. That is thank- helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time. It was really, really good, really helpful. All right, great. Thanks for having me and thank you everyone who listened. And I hope you enjoyed this interview. 
Please don't forget to give it a thumbs up if you're listening on YouTube, review it on your favorite podcast app, and subscribe to the channel to never miss another episode. And I see you next week. <laughs>